the innovative companies who were able to scale to global businesses and to have valuations of billions of dollars. I think there's room for both, and I, would, I think we're not lacking in the first. It would be nice to see some more of the second. Thank you. Uh, in fact, as a personal perspective, uh, I very much agree with you, to be honest. Uh, since concentration of money is also a concentration of power, obviously, it would be nice if we didn't just do the inventing and left all the power to everyone else, um, but actually uh, gave Europe um, a bit more of a stronger backbone. Simon. Uh, I was having a discussion last night over dinner with uh, a, a member of a, a representative of a large corporation who was saying that it was vital that um, if government funded research uh, was performed that the results were kept um, confidential and uh, could be patented by the corporations who had collaborated with them on that research. What would you say to that person if you had the opportunity to uh, have that discussion yourself? Alma? I think this is, this is you. Uh, well, very simply, I would say that I, di I disagree with you completely. If governments fund something, that's us funding something. And what we pay for, we should be able to benefit from. So I don't actually think if, if he tried, or she, it might be, who, who was making the case, if they tried to make a case that, that taking the route that they were advocating was going to benefit society more than taking the route I advocate, I would be prepared to listen to them, but I would still tell them that they were wrong. Our, uh, one of the central tenets of our argument is that publicly funded research should be publicly available. And, and I can't think of anything that could possibly be said against that. <laughs> Does anybody want to disagree? Andy? I don't think you're going to get many people who disagree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I will just say one thing, and that is that I do understand the nervousness of some businesses when they have collaborated with publicly funded, say, university groups or something about um, making what they have done open. But I think in many cases, especially over this Horizon 2020 thing, there is a misunderstanding on the part of some, certainly some industries who are showing nervousness at what is in that, in that uh, legislation. They think that what we're advocating for is that everything they do, all the things that they create in their industry, in their business, uh, must now be made open simply because on some scores they collaborate with a university or two on something. That is absolutely not what we're saying. All we're asking for is that what has been paid for by the public and is going to be published, in fact is published, in academic journals and books should be made freely available to that public that paid for it. If there are industrial secrets behind there that are going to be patented or whatever, that's fine. They can stay there and be patented. As far as we're concerned, we're trying to open up the scholarly literature. And I do think that sometimes there is a misunderstanding that can lead to that kind of fear. I mean, it may not be in this particular case. We don't know because the person isn't going to say anything. But, but um, I think in some, well, I know that in some cases that, that is a misunderstanding. All right. Andy? Uh, I wanted to comment briefly on uh, the uh, Jobs Act and the crowdfunding. Uh, give you a little bit of an update on, on how funding has worked and hasn't worked well in the US, because that's the other thing I do is start up representation. For about 20 years, the laws have been really quite liberal in the United States for startups securing funding from uh, so-called angel investors. And the sort of keystone behind the existing law is that if people have enough money to be able to afford to lose it, they can sort of watch out for themselves, but you can only raise so much money because we don't want the bloodshed to be too uh, broad-based. And then secondarily, you can't advertise. So it has to be sort of one-on-one -on -one so that there's a limitation of, of uh, how uh, easy it is to gull people, basically. 
And uh, it's also very difficult for someone to be an intermediary. So there are very few finders. So even though there are many times uh, the amount per year raised from angels as there are from uh, angel investors, it's all sort of below the surface and it doesn't have a lot of high visibility. What happened with the Jobs Act uh, is a little bit of a salutary uh, uh, story. If you look at where it started and where it ended up, the idea was when Kickstarter and, and uh, these other sites that couldn't sell securities were doing very well, the idea was, gee, why don't we spread this more broadly? Why don't we make it easier to do? Sadly, what happened was what started out as the quote-unquote Jobs Act, uh, assuming that all these little companies would be able to do these little offerings, what eventually happened was they had riders by the financial industry added to it, which relaxed the public reporting requirements, which had been there since the meltdown at the end of the internet bubble, which uh, venture capitalists and emerging companies have been complaining about bitterly, the Sarbanes-Oxley laws, that they said, rightly, do cost them millions of dollars a year and are very, very burdensome. However, in order to get the Jobs Act through, uh, Congress agreed to raise the limit of, quote unquote, a small business to $1 billion in capitalization, which includes small businesses such as Barnes & Noble with hundreds of uh, large outlets ar around the world. That's now a small business. So you had all of this massive deregulation poured on the top. At the same time, because Congress didn't want to open the floodgates to abuse, they told the SEC, you have to come up with the regulations to allow crowdfunding. The SEC then did nothing for nine months, and they finally released the regulations which say that it can only be done through an intermediary. The intermediary has to be registered with the major uh, association which imposes uh, uh, asset tests and uh, 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 certification exam testing. Uh, at any rate, it goes on and on and on with the result that the good news is you're not going to see the legions of snake uh, oil salesmen that undoubtedly would have come in to set up spurious exchanges and fleece people from lots of money. But on the other hand, you're also not going to see any angel networks that were contemplated by the act because it's so burdensome. And the fact that you can only raise under the safe harbor one million that it's not worth anyone's while to register because if you're registered, you wouldn't do a deal that small. So it's sort of a sad tale that after all this good feeling in the press and all of this Jobs Act, what you really saw was a major scam by, imagine this, the financial industry to ram through uh, deregulation that they've been striving to have for a decade at the expense of something which in fact is likely to never happen at all. So it's a great idea. But be aware of what may happen if you try and do the same thing here, that you'll need to take a different approach to avoid something likely, very much like that happening, because the same market interests, somewhat different, but the same market interests are uh, uh, likely to uh, want to ride on the back of it here. So go for it, but beware. Thank you very much. That indeed sounds like something we really don't want to have happen. Um, I, I'm getting signs that we should be heading to the drinks. Um, just a few words uh, to close up. Um, do you have any final words? Should I do the summary? I have a question. Sure. Actually, I have a question briefly for Alma, um, which is that the, the, the problem that you describe, clearly a real problem, um, seems to me to be an opportunity for in innovation. Um, uh, in that you have some big entrenched players who have a sort of um, privileged access business model and um, really it ought to be the case that yes, regulation can play a role, but actually there should be loads and loads of new, of new entrants coming in and disrupting this business model. Now there are some, like Mendeley and, and people like that, but I mean, do you ex would you bet that it will be regulation that solves the problem or innovation? Uh, well, I think we need the, while, while there's a whiff of regulation, I think we're going to go for that and let's get that in place because that, that gives us our policy basis to, uh, to work on. Uh, but yes, I agree with you. We do need innovation. We have the players like you've mentioned, Mendeley and so on. We also have a whole tranche now of open access publishers who are, have a new business model um, and are 
demonstrating that that's a sustainable one. So that's good. And that is innovative in a way. It's not very innovative, <laughs> but it is a bit innovative. And it is helping. I would really like to see more innovation. I think we need a kind of game changer here. We need someone to come in with a completely new idea that everybody, and this is not my generation, or maybe not even your generation, though with respect I say that. I think we're talking about the people who are undergraduates now and young graduate students. I want one of them or somebody who can appeal to them to come along so that they all say, that's a great way of communicating our science. Why don't we do that? I, I'm sure it will happen, but it hasn't happened yet. All right. Thank you very much. Um, in the interest of brevity, let me just try to summarize a few points. So from this panel to the audience and all the legislators and everyone who is active out there, um, I have a couple of points that I take from our various speakers, starting perhaps even with the um, let's do what we can to actually foster a culture of entrepreneurship, first of all, um, change the social value that is attributed to it. There is obviously a lot of potential in crowdfunding and other ways of raising capital. And perhaps we should also look at the other side of things, which is in the area of the tax incentives for um, investment, but perhaps even tax incentive for choosing innovative technologies, which in fact, funnily enough, is a point that came up at last year's entrepreneurship panel at this conference, um, as a way to ease market entry for innovative companies. Um, we had two speakers advocating to think bigger, uh, to not think, you know, it's just enough to, to settle for survival, but actually, you know, um, go for the big one and, you know, try to reach the sky. Maybe we actually need a bit more of that um, thinking. And perhaps one way in which we can help people do that would be to find ways to shape hubs of expertise, you know, create that friend effect where someone can tell you something about how this is done, how this is works, how this works. I mean, I know from my own experience that it is not so easy to get by that information in Europe. I mean, I had to dig a bit to actually get to it. Um, of course, we want innovation based on scientific progress, which is funded by the public for the purpose of making innovation and economic activity happen as one of the goals. That currently isn't happening on the level it should be, so I think this is clearly something we need to be looking at. 